Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. This is Dr. Greer, and I would like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to uh, share information and experiences that we have with uh, all of you regarding uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and DisclosureProject.org and the work we're doing on new energy systems uh, through the OrionProject.org. And uh, we're going to have a really interesting show today because we have a, a man with us who's been involved for a couple of years with uh, CSETI and the contact protocols we've developed uh, using uh, higher states of consciousness and a number of other techniques for making contact with uh, transdimensional interstellar civilizations. And uh, this is a gentleman who has really uh, had uh, some amazing experiences just in the last year and a half or so. And he uh, is uh, just an, an amazing uh, example of the kinds of, of developments that can happen when you really give yourself to the process and to the meditation protocols and techniques that, that we have developed. And um, his name is uh, Dr. Bill Gray. He's a Stanford-trained medical doctor. He does uh, really pioneering work uh, in homeopathy, and he's actually developing a uh, an app for homeopathy uh, that will be, I think, a really big breakthrough, and he may want to mention that as well. And he first uh, started coming to things about a year and a half ago and uh, came for a full week at Crestone, Colorado, uh, back in 2011, I believe it was, and, and then has come to several of these expeditions since then. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to the show, uh, Bill, and I'm so glad you can be here. Oh, I'm very pleased to be here myself. I'm oh, great. Well, why don't you tell folks just a little bit about you know how you got involved in your experiences that, that began to develop, because it's really a great story. Well, um, it, it, it really is a lifelong thing, being interested in UFOs and so on. I come from an aviation family, and uh, I've always been fascinated by what goes on in the sky and so on, but uh, nothing really developed until just in the last, uh, like you say, the last year and a half. Um, I also was a meditator for about 40 years, but I also found using different techniques in meditation that I really wasn't getting anywhere. Um, I seemed to be focusing too much on the techniques and and um, didn't have any way of judging whether I was making progress or not, and that frustrated me. So when I heard about Stephen's work with C. Seti, um, I thought, well, if uh, you know, if that's possible, then I'd really like to learn that. And uh, so I signed up for uh, first a, a three-day program in Southern California that uh, was actually very interesting and taught me that the meditative experiences that I could have were um, outstanding. But the real transformation happened when I was in Crestone for the seven-day program. And... Um, uh, just to fill in what happens is we go out in the evening, uh, late evening, and uh, we're under the stars in a circle, and we all do several meditations, some of them guided by Stephen and uh, some just on our own. And uh, I was having my normal meditative experiences when um, Stephen suggested that we could just literally ask for the ETs to show themselves to us in consciousness and um, um, and then also suggested that we could visit their planet. And so what happened to me was I took that very literally, and sure enough, um, an ET uh, introduced himself to me and um, it came inside my consciousness, unified with my consciousness, and uh, took me to his planet. And right. I could I could tell detailed experiences about that, but it was a very real experience. I mean, just as real as I am right now. Uh, it was a profound experience for me. Yeah, I, what we want to describe some of that because it was so uh, very okay. graphic. I remember when it happened, and I remember the meditation when it happened because it was a very deep um, and and higher consciousness experience. Uh, that the whole so group I, was was very coherent. Um, that's one of the tricks of this whole process or one of the uh, fundamental elements 
the whole group was very unified and so the the meditation went much deeper than than what I can um do on my own generally um but uh in this very coherent state it was a very deep meditation um uh actually first what happened is I went through a series of of kind of uh, car racing sort of things in black and white, which was interesting, which I later figured out is probably the the ET's uh, electronic uh, connections with consciousness being enhanced to connect with me um, probably needed a little bit of tuning. <laughs> so what was happening was I was experiencing something, but it wasn't exactly what they were trying to communicate. Right. And uh, when I... Um, said, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Then all of a sudden, I was on his planet, and um, there was a tall being about Stephen's size, about, I'd say, six feet, four or five, something like that, um, brown-skinned, um, bald head, but with um, kind of a little shock of reddish hair coming out of the top of his head and down to his shoulders. Uh, he was... Um, normal human um, shape, two arms, two legs, you know, normal torso. His face was, was kind of, uh, he had sort of a squarish jaw and uh, thin lips and very deep and very loving eyes. And the experience I had was of great compassion and great respect at the same time. Right, and right. inviting me, just as I had been inviting him, he was inviting me to have a relationship. And he showed me around his planet, which is a, a small planet, um, kind of a sharp horizon, uh, green, greenish-yellow sky, um, kind of yellowish ground. But actually, we were walking on a portion of the ground that was um, jet black, and very firm, which I later uh, learned just from reading that um, is a sign of an early stage of development of a planet. That's right, right. Which I didn't know at the time. So it's an interesting confirmation. And we communicated telepathically, um, rapid fire questions that I had, where he was from, which he didn't answer for security reasons, I understand. Um, and uh, um, but what his job is as a, is as an ambassador. He lives mostly in space, and um, he's an ambassador to all kinds of planets that are undergoing transformation, just like we are. And um, so he's anxious to make contact. And he he's not the only one. They're very they're all very anxious. It's just that we're not very open. <laughs> so right. It it took an opening on my part to be able to. Uh, communicate with him since then uh, he's taken me on his craft uh, shown me around uh, as a matter of fact uh, later on in the week in Crestone his craft showed up behind me in association with um, sounds that, that we've associated with him um, on my magnetometer right and um, it's a very lyrical kind of symphonic type sound and um, uh, all you know, towards the end of the week, both happened: the magnetometer, and uh, one one uh, person in our group could see him in subtle form, and also a lot of the group saw the craft uh, behind me. And when right. I turned around, it had the exact lighting that that I saw when when I was with him originally. Right, and I want to put in a little bit here for people who are new that the, what's a lot of what Bill's talking about is the fact that these interstellar civilizations or technologies interface directly with thought and consciousness. And back in 1991, I wrote a paper that made its way through the aerospace industry and the CIA. I later learned about technology-assisted consciousness and also consciousness-assisted technology. And these are very high-voltage electromagnetic scalar systems um, that are longitudinal electromagnetic waves, meaning that they don't have the sine wave of normal uh, electromagnetic waves such as light or microwave, and they are actually at multiples of the speed of light. And these technologies are, are so well-developed and refined that they interface with 
lucid consciousness and what people you know the mystic tradition would say the astral dream state and the reason these protocols work because it's based based on the vedic understanding of the consciousness uh that's within us being this omnipresent field of the samadhi state of the infinite mind that we uh, go through a series of uh protocols we actually do a puja every evening and then we do um, a meditation using a, a mantra and then from there I take people on a, on a journey as it were with an expansion of consciousness that begins to expand and experience the whole cosmos uh, and actually there's you can go to disclosureproject.org there's a whole training program for this uh, on the website there that you can get and what the reason these are effective is because you know we use like iPhones and Androids and cell phones that are traveling at the speed of light. But if you're going from one star system to another, the speed of light is too slow because it would take, they say from the Andromeda galaxy that's millions of light years away, it would take millions of years at the speed of light or at the speed of uh, a radio signal or a cell phone signal for a signal to get there and then millions of years to re reply. So any of these interstellar civilizations that we, of course, have proven are here through the Disclosure Project work have to have technologies that drop out of linear space-time into these trans-dimensional or other dimensions utilizing very advanced electronics uh, that are these uh, uh, high-voltage, low-current uh, systems that actually, if we could develop them here, would give us also free energy and anti-gravity on Earth, and we'll get into that in a moment. But in terms of contact protocols, the reason people have these experiences uh, when they have a breakthrough like, like uh, Dr. Gray is describing is because they have gone into a very deep and quiet state of consciousness that, that I uh, help people develop that ability, and we're doing it as a group, and we're intentionally inviting the ETs to interface with us, and they do. And when you have that experience, then you'll suddenly find, once you make that connection, we'll have these magnetic field meters that pick up the change in the magnetic field that's around you. And these are used by electronics people to test devices and things, but we're out in remote areas where there is no electronic uh, source of, of uh, radiation or magnetic fields. Uh, and suddenly they will start making a sound that they don't make if you just put them up to a cell phone or a refrigerator or a microwave. They'll make these um, sort of uh, very communicative. It's as if they're talking through the electronics. Uh, and, in fact, that is what they're doing. They're connecting to the circuitry in an energy field that's nonlinear. Um, and they're causing the magnetic field to shift in a way that these devices become a communication device. And you can actually feel... Uh, and I know, Bill, you've experienced this, the emotion and the meaning of what they're communicating, even though it's through this, you know, just this dumb box that you can buy for a couple hundred bucks that, you know, picks up magnetic field changes around electronic devices. Uh, and so it's really amazing. And, and it's, it's very specific to each being, and it's very communicative. And, well, it's just mind-blowing to people when they first experience it, I think. I've, I've had a, a number of other experiences with other ETs, but I have to say that the communication that we do through the magnetometers are, are probably the most valuable to me. I go out about once a week. Uh, I live in the mountains, and I have a little clearing, and I just sit out there. And instantly, when I turn on the magnetometer, every single time for the last, you know, every week for the last year and a half, they are there instantly. And uh, now that I've uh, met a number of other ETs, they all have their own signals, and they sort of all chime in at once, I mean, uh, one after the other. And uh, even just uh, uh, the night before last, there was a new uh, ET. There was a dolphin ET that we just had a recent experience with in uh, Borrego Springs. Um, Lore was there, the, the one from Crestone, um, another one I call Charmin. And they each ex express themselves one after another for 45 minutes straight. And the thing that I find most valuable is as I meditate, that becomes like a, bi a biofeedback mechanism. The deeper I go, the more excited they get. And if I start getting tired or too cold or, 
you know, I want to go in, um, then I say to myself, just mentally, um, okay, uh, that's enough for tonight, and they instantly shut off. They instantly stop communicating, which is not a magnetometer anomaly of some sort. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, that, that's an extreme interaction with uh, beings from all over the universe. It's, it's just an amazing experience, and, and it's available to everybody. It is available to everyone, and it's interesting because now we have an, uh, an iPhone and an Android app where the meditation protocols and techniques and all that's in there and actually will turn your, your, self, your, uh, your smartphone into a magnetometer. It will turn it into a magnetic field meter, although it, you know, your phone isn't going to be as good as one of these uh, commercial devices that we use, and, and I know that Bill has gotten as well. The, the other thing I want to point out is that while we're having these conversations with these electronic devices, uh, we're also having the remote view experience. We're in consciousness. We're seeing these beings. And then around us with our physical eyes, we're seeing these energy forms. And many of them, uh, a lot of the photographs that Emory Smith and other people have taken, Deb Warren, there will actually be beings there. And if you go to CSETI.org, you'll see a picture that was from three years ago where an ambassador from the Andromeda Galaxy literally was there in this electronic astral projection. It's as if you, it was like the Royce Secretions, but if you could electronically digitize your astral body and, and make it appear so it could be in a photograph, that's what this looks like hovering right outside our circle uh, during our contact protocol in Joshua Tree National Park. And for many people, this all this sounds so futuristic and far out, and yet I tell people, but it totally makes sense that the primary science of any interstellar civilization is the science of consciousness and this kind of knowledge because once you go beyond the speed of light, you are in these other dimensions that are increasingly like a lucid dream or an astral body projection or a deep meditation that's very visual. And I always tell people that the number one way that humans have had contact with these other uh, civilizations over uh, the millennia of, of known human history have been in these sort of states of consciousness, although along with that we will then have these uh, electromagnetic manifestations and even craft fully materialize around us or in the sky and fly over, uh, which, of course, we have on videotape and, and photograph. But, but it, So it happens on every dimension. So it, it's physical, it's electromagnetic, it's in thought and consciousness, and it's very personal because there's this deep personal and emotional and spiritual connection that begins to develop with these uh, ETs because they're actually very excited is what I've been told for the last 20 some years that I've been training people to do this uh, since 1990 that there are groups of people who are beginning to understand the science of consciousness and the science of the next millennium of the you know the ending of the Mayan calendar is next week but it's really the end of that old world that's stuck in the box of linearity and 3D and the opening of a whole another understanding where uh, the, the conscious dimension of the cosmos, even scientifically, will be added to our culture uh, in terms of higher states of consciousness and technologies that reflect that higher state of consciousness. And this is required in order for anyone to be an ambassador from Earth to these people, which is what we call our training program as ambassadors to the universe, um, because we feel that unless someone is, becomes adept in this process of meditation, and remote viewing and understanding this new cosmology that incorporates the conscious universe along with these new high-tech electromagnetic very high voltage uh, scalar systems they're not going to be able to understand any contact they're going to have with an ET civilization they're not going to be able to even comprehend the various ways that ETs will manifest uh, in your backyard or, or in your room or out under the stars in a national forest somewhere because you, you'll have no foundation for understanding it because we're dealing with civilizations that are anywhere from several hundred thousand to several million years technologically more developed than we are now. And for us to begin to have an experience that begins to make any sense, we have to develop a paradigm and very specific technical understanding so that we can understand 
they comprehend what they're, how they're interacting with this, what they're saying, how they're saying it. And that's what this whole week-long training process is for, although the week goes by very quickly and we always feel like we should be there for a month or two. But people have had – one of the great things about uh, Dr. Gray is that he gave himself to this in a very pure-hearted way. And, and as I see it as, as the as teacher of this, is that – he gave himself to it in a way that was pure-hearted and wholehearted, and that's why he had these breakthroughs so quickly. And I've seen this happen before. The thing that keeps people from being able to do this is that their intellect gets in the way, and they say, oh, I can't do this or I won't do it. Instead of just following the protocols and going with the flow of it, and if you kind of just give yourself and go with the flow of it, it it's, it's really easy. One thing I might add just as a – for in case people aren't too familiar, is uh, the the fusion in consciousness that happens in communing with the ETs is not like a trance state. It's not like you're, you know, becoming a medium and you're you're not yourself and you're becoming them. The the it's a real intimate connection with another consciousness, but with full awareness and respect actually for your own consciousness so it's a it's a two-way street interaction right and um and you can always you know if you decided that you were bored or you wanted to do something else it they are completely and totally respectful that way and um on the other hand if you're very open and ask them to show what they're doing what their daily life is and all that sort of thing they're perfectly happy to do that right and, the, and, the, and, you know, the same begins to extend into the, the sort of more 3D um, uh, aspects. I mean, it's I have found that when you open up a link to these interstellar uh, civilizations and you let them know that you're willing to let them communicate through a radar detector or a magnetometer and that you're open to that, then it will happen because they know that you put your awareness on it and that you're uh, alert to that. So what my experience has been over the years is that this is an evolving thing. And I, I think another thing that's so beautiful is that they want it to be interactive and they're not going to do things beyond what people are ready for. But if you're ready for it, then it's like, you know, the sky's the limit. Or yeah, anything's <laughs> the limit. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's what's so wonderful. And then it can continue in the lucid dream state or, you know, just in your own meditations uh, when you're on your own. And um, I tell people that we're at this point right now, everyone thinks that this is sort of a cycle with the ending of the Mayan calendar and everything. Um, that is about Earth, but it's not. It's actually a universal cycle that the, this big Earth cycle is coinciding with. So what's happening is that we're syncing up with a big universal cycle of uh, unity, of higher consciousness that is sweeping not just Earth, but the entire cosmos. And so there's this potentiation. And, you know, within the next uh, few hundred years, uh, every planet in the physical cosmos is going to be united. And that process, though, is being accelerated right now. And so it's not just about world peace. It's about universal peace. It's not just about a, 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 a new human cycle. It's a universal cycle. And so we're in a universal moment. And this is really an amazing thing to contemplate. And when you step into doing this, because there are – I joke often that you know Hillary Clinton isn't doing this, and he, she's our Secretary of State, and, and the U.N. Secretary Generals and the ones I've met with and, and dealt with personally aren't doing this. Therefore, who's who's – doing this on earth well it has to be we the people and it has to be people who have a certain level of enlightened knowledge about consciousness and remote viewing and uh, very advanced electronic technologies and how faster than the speed of light civilizations who are capable of reaching here might manifest and there's uh, this uh, latest book we put out a couple years ago called um, uh, Extraterrestrial um, uh, Accounting uh, Contact Countdown to Transformation, which uh, you, you can you can find at Amazon.com and also 
um, at etcontactnow.com. I think that if you look at that book, it has, uh, you know, kind of a synopsis of decades of these sorts of experiences from our group. And there's also a DVD that comes with it that has a, 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 certain, a number of really amazing images of the contact that's happened over the years. But um, what we find is that it really doesn't matter where you are. A lot of people say, well, do you have to be, you know, at Mount Shasta? Or do you have? I said, no. I mean, uh, I, I think, Bill, you can you tell people you live out uh, in, in an area in uh, Alpha, I'm in Santa the Santa mountains Cruz. above San Jose, between San Jose and Santa Cruz, and there's really nobody around. Um, right. Um, and so it's completely isolated, but it, it happens every single night for me. Yeah. Exactly, and so once that once that contact is made, it begins to continue, and it will continue, and it can happen in all kinds of enigmatic ways. Uh, but and people have to be open to the idea that it can happen in the meditative state, it can happen in the dream state, it can happen in three dimensional space time with a craft or a being that's right there, uh, and they're very eager for people to learn to do this because. Uh, they know that this next phase in human existence is one of the development of not just material sciences that would get us off of oil and gas and coal, which we certainly need to do and, and really should have happened 100 years ago, but also the ability to understand mass cancellation technologies, things that enable, for example, a craft to achieve zero mass and therefore blip into another dimension and go from one star system to another. Um, and, and, of course, this has been done in classified programs that I'm aware of. And uh, But humans are going to have to begin to understand a whole new area of science that isn't being taught at Caltech and MIT and what have you, um, because these have been unfortunately kept secret. Um, this is why my, my autobiography sort of is, is called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, because all of this has been hidden, and it's sort of a forbidden area to talk about it, and yet I find that when I talk to people who who work or have worked with the CIA or, or very classified uh, programs at Lockheed, uh, they smile and go, yes, of course. I mean, this is where the action has been for decades. Um, but the public doesn't know. What we're trying to do is bridge, bridge this big gulf, not only in terms of science and technology, but in consciousness and understanding, but put it into a paradigm of instead of it just being a material science, it's really the foundation of a whole new understanding of reality, of ourselves, and it crosses into the healing arts, it, it crosses into uh, communication systems, and into our whole place in the cosmos. And it's very, it's, it's, well, it's not a religious undertaking, it's a spiritual undertaking, because the root of it is the understanding of this, uh, the, the, the oneness of consciousness and mind that is the foundation of all existence. And uh, even physical, material existence is actually consciousness phasing and resonating as atoms and uh, subatomic particles and quarks and uh, photons and what have you. And so once you begin to understand how the science of consciousness integrates into the new physics and these new energy sciences, but also that these technologies that are communication devices that ET civilizations have, you know, those, those interface with clear, coherent thought emanating from a deep and quiet level of consciousness uh, as easily as, as you and I deal with uh, talking on a cell phone. And that sounds really magical to people when they first hear about it. And they think, oh, this can't be, and it's crazy. But you know what? If you went back, you know, I live down the road here from Thomas Jefferson's house. If you went back a couple hundred years and showed Thomas Jefferson an iPhone or an Android phone with video streaming and awe and, you know, uh, FaceTime and Skyping and everything else, they would think that you were a, a, a witch or a warlock or, you know, it would just be completely magical. And that's only 200 years. So we're dealing with civilizations that, that you know, are, are in the th thousands and, and in some cases millions of years more developed than we are right now. And so we have to have enough humility to, to understand that we have to explore and open our minds to these possibilities and it's this impulse for uh, curiosity and exploration and open-mindedness that's really so important if you're going to be an ambassador 
uh, from humanity at this time in history to these civilizations. And I think that's the other thing. There's sort of a childlike um, innocence and joy of this kind of uh, experience, uh, isn't it, Bill, I think, for many yes, of us? Yes, and, and it's uh, mutual. It, it's uh, they're as childlike and innocent and learning about us as we are about them. Right. I mean, they're far advanced, but um, they, you know, for them, unity and consciousness is literally unity in the entire cosmos, and change is happening all over the place. So the changes that we're undergoing here um, are just as important to them as any of the changes that they have in, in their daily life. Right. And they express that very clearly. You know, it's, they're very excited. Um, this last time in Borrego Springs, um, I had contact with uh, actually a family of, of ETs that um, uh, sort of stayed with me. We, we uh, you know, communed for, I'd say, about three hours in the morning <laughs> um, after connecting the night before. And then they even went through uh, the day with me and um, continued on for for a few weeks afterwards. Um, I call them the tourists because uh, they were fascinated by our planet and by what I could show them and what they could learn from my consciousness as well as what they could show me of their planet. Yeah, no, and that's how they, they really are excited about that. And what the other thing that I found is that in the last couple of years in particular, there seems to be something that shifted with the work we've been doing, and that is that there are, at every one of these expeditions, um, there seem to be new civilizations that are being introduced to humans, meaning homo sapiens mm -hmm. from Earth, for the first time. And it's an interesting experience for them and for us. Um, and that's been part of the privilege of what's going on with me. I actually asked uh, Thor um, to train me from their level to be an ambassador so that uh, you know, they could come to me and the shy ones can come to me and trust me, and that is what's been happening. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's one of the things many people keep having happen uh, after they come on these expeditions and it begins to evolve, and then there are new groups that get introduced, and it, it really becomes very personal with these individuals, very similar to what happened you know, the night that, that uh, my good friend and person who would worked with me for years during the 1990s, uh, that, that Sherry Adamek uh, passed away, um, that night she, in her spirit form, introduced me to this E.T. who I had never seen before uh, that I call kindness because she's sort of an incarnation of just pure kindliness. And this particular E.T. It usually appears in a bluish-white craft and Virtually every expedition we've been on since 1998 for 14 years, this being has appeared in that craft, fully materialized in the, in the atmosphere and film. And we all have seen it. Yes, everyone has seen this. And, and it becomes a very personal, longitudinal experience. Um, and I think that's part of the dynamic. And uh, as, as Rupert Sheldrake talked about, this morphogenic field is being created where because enough people now, thousands of people are doing this in hundreds of locations all over the world, and dozens of countries all over the world, that it's creating a shift in consciousness that's potentiating this future of integration between Earth and these other civilizations and that more and more civilizations are being introduced to humans at this time in our history, even though the, the entire planet obviously isn't quite ready for prime time. We have a lot of wars and dysfunction and injustices and criminality and murderous behavior going on. Uh, but And yet there's always got to be the leading edge pioneering group, and that's kind of what the people who... Who, who feel moved to do this of end up being called to do. And in terms of the transformation that uh, that I personally experienced, and I think others have too, there's nothing special about what's happening with me. Um, it, it does. It has had a profound effect. I mean, the meditation is validated for me in ways that uh, I've never had before in 40 years of meditation experience you know now i know exactly what i'm experiencing all the time and it's it's fed back to me very directly 
But more than that, I notice the change in my orientation towards life. When, you know, things go wrong, you know, I don't know, know, the power goes out or the phones go out or the Internet goes out or, um, you know, in practice things aren't going the way they should be. You know, it used to be that I would would get, um, you know, appropriately upset about these things. (laughs) And uh, now I find that there's a lot more serenity because I'm seeing things from a, a much broader perspective, you know, and in the infinity of the whole thing, uh, all of these are just changes, and they're not anything so profound that I have to get overreactive about them. So um, I have to say the transformation that I've learned through the C-SETI experience, and specifically, Stephen, through your meditation training, um, has had a profound effect on me. Well, thank you. I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, I... The only reason I keep doing what I'm doing is because of people like you who really are getting benefit that are able to move forward. Um, I, my aspiration has always been that I can share what I know to the point that I'm irrelevant. <laughs> so, so, so I could well, depart the thing. Well, I haven't achieved that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I have actually. <laughs> But uh, by the way, those people who are uh, we've been asking, uh, people have asked, there are no more of these expeditions um, this year. There will be one in uh, early February of 2013 on uh, this island that we go to in the Gulf of Mexico. It's called Marco Island, Florida, and it'll be a week-long expedition. Um, and you can find out about that at etcontactnow.com. That's etcontactnow.com. And I think there's still a few positions open for that for in February. Um, and then there's also a schedule where we are planning to do, uh, of course, our, our week-long event in Crestone and, uh, and also up at uh, Mount Shasta uh, in the summer and in the desert southwest. And we're also going to be going to England to the crop circles, and we're going to spend a whole week. Um, it's a little different because there's less um, didactic and training. It is for people who really get that already because during the day we're actually going to new crop circles and we do sort of teaching uh, periods and, and meditations in the crop circles during the day, and then we have this fantastic 1,800-acre um, farm that's in, near Alton Barnes um, where all the where the landing of the ET craft in 92 happened with C. SETI, but also where many of the most incredible crop circles have appeared over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and that will be in July in England. So all that information um, for the people who want to come is at etcontactnow.com. And uh, what we're planning to do um, is also, it's looking like the film uh, Sirius will have enough of it completed that uh, we're hoping that we um, will be at the, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to be at Sundance um, just doing a, a small sort of a trailer clip of the film, and uh, then we're planning to also be at South by Southwest, um, and around that time um, in, in March, have perhaps a three-day expedition out in the hill country of Texas, which would be a lot of fun. So we haven't plan the dates of that yet, but just, uh, you know, uh, stay tuned. And and if you want to get on our mailing list, you can go to the website and uh, sign up for our information and uh, newsletters and everything for free. Um, You can do that at any of the sites, disclosureproject.org or uh, ET Contact Now. And what we'll do is let you know when we get those dates hammered down. This is all being – it's very dynamic because the production company is still working on the uh, uh, the, the film, and we, we still have some production elements to do with this, the genetic work on this little ET um, body that you have heard about that we've worked on. Um, you can see the updates for that, by the way, at uh, serious.neverendinglight.com, and um, we have a, a, a professor of genetics who's one of the most renowned uh, geneticists in the world. Uh, setting up and running the genetic test, and we've also had other experts look at uh, this small ET uh, specimen, which I, we think is a one- to two-year-old baby, uh, that uh, has looked at it and has concluded that 
it, number one, is not an aborted fetus, and number two, is does not conform to any known skeletal genetic defect um, or uh, malformation. And by the way, the person who did the examination uh, of the x-rays and CT scan for this is the uh, leading expert in the world on skeletal anomalies and defects in children and fetuses. So um, we're having some really top drawer people examine this, but some of this material um, we're hoping to get into this film serious. And so, um, of course, we're racing our deadlines to do that. But anyway, all things are moving forward um, very, very quickly now, and we're getting into uh, the sort of final stretch in the last in the next month or so. So even though the film won't be completely finished, we're going to do a, a presentation and I have a trailer that we can show at Sundance this year, which is in January, and then we hope we can, we can have the whole thing finished in time for uh, South by Southwest, which is, of course, the big film and technology conference that's in Austin, Texas every year. Interestingly about that, um, there's a group called the Foo Fighters, and Dave Grohl uh, will be the keynote speaker at South by Southwest. And, of course, uh, he's quite interested in UFOs. And, in fact, the word Foo Fighter is from World War II, uh, and it was used by the military. It came from the word foe, uh, fire, and uh, firefighters that were these UFOs that were flying all around our aircraft during uh, the war with Germany. And it was interesting because at that time, the uh, Foo Fighters, not the rock group, but the things that were actually in the air flying around our aircraft, we thought it was a secret Nazi weapon, but the Nazis thought it was a secret Allied weapon because the same thing was happening to them. And a good friend of mine, who I think, Bill, since you're a doctor, will, and you'll enjoy this, who is a uh, hematologist, pathologist in Denver, John Altshuler. Dr. Altshuler was the nephew of, of uh, General Jimmy Doolittle. And General Doolittle was a very famous general in World War II. And um, uh, FDR, uh, Roosevelt, sent General Doolittle over to Europe to look into what in the hell these Foo Fighters were. And uh, he came back to the White House, and General Doolittle told President Roosevelt, well, sir, those are, quote, and I'm quoting here, interplanetary vehicles. So people wonder how long there has been interest in investigations on this, and it goes at least back to then, if not before. Um, and this, I know, is a very reliable account because Dr. Altshuler was as straight a shooter as they come, and, and he was told this directly by General Doolittle, who was his uncle. So I think that... You know, when you, <laughs> it, it's sort of an interesting confluence that we're going to be wrapping up this film in time for it to be at South by Southwest. Um, and the lead guy for this rock band, the Foo Fighters, which is one of the largest in the world now, is the keynote speaker. And the name of his band is basically means UFO. I mean, that was what a UFO was called in, in the European theater of operations during World War II. So um, I think it's all quite an interesting set of coincidences and, and very uh, exciting. There's a lot going on these days. <laughs> oh, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Certainly. You know, I, I asked uh, my ET team, if you want to call them that, about the upcoming uh, 21st of December thing. And... Um, uh, they're take. I mean, because I have friends who talk about this, and they're they've got all these doomsday scenarios in their head, and you know, even if it's on a subtle plane, it's going to be such a radical change that n nothing will ever be the same again, and all this kind of thing. Um, and it, my ETs seem to say, no, that uh, that's not their orientation at all. It's extreme excitement all over that there will be change, but. Uh, and it's it's an exciting change, and it's something that they're very much looking forward to, and that's part of what this whole connection with us is all about. Well, that's right, and I think I, I think that what they understand very well is that we're at this pivotal point in our civilization that everything from the Mayan calendar to the Hopi prophecy to teachings from people from all over the world has. Um, sort of foreseen, and that is a time when uh, we're going to come together as a global civilization and make a very large change in how we live on the planet. And I think that 
20 to 100 years from now will be more different from today than today is from 10,000 years ago in the era of cavemen. And, and I think that this is uh, it's very exciting, and the rate of development, conscious evolution, as well as material evolution is uh, going to take a big jump forward. And this interstellar cosmic perspective is a key part of it, as are these technologies, because uh, you know, I was doing an interview or I had a conference call recently with uh, a man who's hosting a big uh, event around the Mayan calendar uh, ending, uh, and his name is Michael Short, and he and he was on this uh, this radio show with with me a, a couple weeks ago, and one of the things we talked about is that it is a universal moment, and that the technologies and the way we live on this material planet is a reflection of the aggregate consciousness of the people. In other words, if you look at how we're living today with all of our energy technologies and transportation technologies are destructive. They burn things or they split the atom and cause poisonous cancer causing radiation in the way of nuclear power or it's burning a fuel or exploding a rocket. It's all explosive, violent. But that also kind of is reflecting this end of the Kali Yuga, the end of this cycle that we're closing up where there's been a lot of warfare and strife and division. Whereas the new technologies are in sync with the new consciousness of unity, peace, home, homeostasis, balance, where you're pulling energy out of the, the fabric of space-time. You're not burning or destroying anything. You're not splitting the atom, causing huge amounts of radiation, like in Fukushima, that's poisoning the entire west coast of America right now. You're not uh, burning coal that's dirtying the air and causing cancer and lung disease. So, what? And even in the it's way of the anti with unity. And exactly, and it's a unity consciousness-based technology and so all of this is kind of has, has to happen together because you really can't go to this next level of science and technology with a without a concomitant leap in consciousness for a couple of reasons one people just wouldn't get it and number two it'd be dangerous because uh, one of the things that conversations i've had many times with people at the pentagon and, and, the, and the cia is is that you know, they'll pull me aside and they say, Dr. Greer, you know that these kind of really advanced high voltage uh, systems that do all this, uh, what they call WSFM, weird science and frickin' magic is what they call it at the CIA, um, could be turned into a weapon. I said, yes, of course. I said, I took care of many people who were killed with steak knives. I mean, you don't need a high tech system to kill someone. But that begs this larger question of, do we go forward with 7 billion people cannibalizing the power with these destructive energy technologies? Or do we come together as a people, decide to live together in unity, in peace, in collective security, and bring out the technologies that would eliminate poverty and injustice and give us a period of abundance and a foundation for social development and conscious evolution going thousands of years into the future – where we're living in harmony with Gaia, with the earth. This is this choice that we have to make, and we have to make it all of us together. And so, in a sense, even the material problems of the planet have at their root a, a spiritual source. And so the solution has to be spiritual. And this, as Einstein said, no problem was ever solved from the level of consciousness that created it. And so we have to achieve a different type of consciousness of uh, peaceful cooperation. People, humans are always going to have differences. You get two people together, you're going to have three opinions. But it doesn't mean you have to pull out weapons and blow each other up. And so I think that we have to find a way of going forward as a people, as a civilization, in, in a way that's peaceful and unified, um, because these, this next level of uh, development is one that is based in higher consciousness, and the technologies are actually flowing out of a unity state of consciousness and physics um, that are incredibly powerful, but 
they can be misused. Uh, the early stages of that have already been done in the last 50 years where we have taken some of these technologies that have been classified and used them to target extraterrestrial vehicles and shoot them down or disable them. And that has happened dozens of times that I'm aware of personally. And I think that this is another reason why the whole world needs to know about this issue and why disclosure is so important, but also why there has to be a very clear uh, consciousness behind uh, what we're doing even with these sciences and and how they're going to be utilized. Uh, Because what we don't need to do is reinvent the mistakes of the last 100 to 200 years going forward in the next uh, decade or two. Um, And so we're at this point where is it a huge change that has to happen, both in consciousness but also in social and political thinking and uh, and deep spirituality, not necessarily religiosity, but you know, deep spirituality. So, well, um, personally, actually, in the same direction, and this is not a plug or anything, but uh, just to talk about how all this has affected me, is that I've started a new company based on the whole idea of uh, unity and bringing new energies into the world. I call it uh, Coherence Apps. And um, uh, it's inspired to um, actually transmit through um, iPhones or smartphones healing energies uh, that are individualized to um, people so that, um, you know, whatever is going on in health can be transformed by the energy itself. Right. I don't think that can be made into any kind of a weaponized system. So I think there's going to be a, a lot of these kind of things as we get inspired to move in these directions. Right, right. And ultimately, though, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to live on this planet in a compassionate way, not just compassionate with Gaia, but compassionate with our fellow humans because many people talk about these apocalyptic things. I say, well, you know, when you have almost half of the world doesn't have apoctopian, doesn't have plumbing, doesn't have adequate food or electricity or refrigeration. Um, you have 7 billion people, and, and, and only a small number of them are living well. And they're living well because they're at the top of the pyramid in this very destructive uh, energy uh, system that was based in the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s of burning oil and gas and coal and the mid uh, 20th century with a nuclear power, which is even more destructive in many ways. If, if you doubt it, look at what happened in Japan. But I think that what what we have to, to figure out is that even to be compassionate with um, our fellow humans, uh, meaning all of humanity, that these science and technologies have to come out, but that we also have to be wise enough to bring them out in a way where they are used only for peaceful purposes and that we have the means to ensure that. And and actually, you know, the, the head of the Air Force, um, uh, there, there's an office of, of future technologies, believe it or not, and the colonel who was head of that that I've met with and I talked about this at great length. Um, because, uh, you know, he, he knew about this area of science and and I said yes but you know it gets to be a chicken egg thing do do we keep letting so many things happen in the world because of the poverty and injustice that we just devolve further and further into conflict um, or do we bring out sciences and technologies that would alleviate poverty and this conflict and stop the environmental damage, but at the same time put reasonable means in place to ensure that they're they're not weaponized. And I said we're going to have to figure out how to do that, and this is the huge challenge of the last hundred years that no one has wanted to talk about. What's happened is that the the classified programs have just slapped security clearances on them and national security orders on these technologies and says, no, the world can't have these yet. Meanwhile, the world is dying. And yeah, so and the environment is, is dying and we're suffocating Gaia and the polar ice caps are melting. And um, you have over half of uh, 7 billion people living in abject poverty. So this becomes something where when you look at this, 
Um, the ETs are watching this as well, frankly, and uh, many people who've had contact do get a message about the need for healing on this planet and also to help the environment. And um, uh, many, many people who've had contact have had that as a message from the ETs, and I think mm-hmm. that's a message that we continue to receive, and that certainly I've had. So... Well, um, I think we're about out of time. I don't know if you have anything else you want to share in the next couple of minutes, Bill, about your experiences, um, because you've had such great ones over the last couple of years. Well, the main thing um, to communicate um, that I would say from my own experience is that anyone can actually do this. I mean, literally, um, there's nothing – I mean, this is not false humility – uh, there's nothing special about me that made me available to do this. Uh, I think it's just uh, the willingness to actually do it. Give yourself permission to actually do it. Right. And um, the techniques are developed through CSETI and through Stephen's, uh, you know, DVDs and books and everything to get yourself ready for it. Um, and then it's just a matter of, of actually taking the step and doing it and believing that it can happen. Right, and if you know, if you think it can happen, it will, and if you think it can't, it won't. Exactly. And I, so much of it is has to do with your realizing that those of us who are, and the, the, this is why I love the growing circle of people from all walks of life who are having this experience. I mean, a few years ago, there was a, an old. Uh, a talk show host named Art Bell who had a show on Coast to Coast AM and he he liked for me to be on his show and um there was a he had a contest at one point uh to see if people could really remote view and so he had put something uh, on his refrigerator with, with a magnet and asked for people to remote view it and it was sort of a contest that he did to see if anyone could really do that and the person who called in and who got it was a man named Bob Harrogrove, who lives in the San Diego area, who had come to a couple of the C-SETI week-long expeditions where we teach these meditation and remote viewing techniques. And he nailed it precisely. And this guy was, is, you know, he's sort of a saw-the-earth um, guy and you know, a title examiner and real estate guy. I mean, he wasn't sort of a guru that had spent 18 years on a bed of nails or, or done any esoteric, ascetic training. And, and I remember um, Art Bell going, my God, this is exactly correct. And you're the only person. How did you? And the guy said, well, I just went for a week out in the desert with Dr. Greer and learned to do these things. And it it's easy. And so the fact is, is that it has nothing to do whether you've spent 40 years in an ashram or not. In reality, it's about knowing you can do it and some instruction and and then saying, I can do this. And so I love telling that story because Bob is such a great guy and just, again, salt of the earth sort of, um, not good old boy, but, I mean, just sort of a regular guy. And, and you know, he, he's certainly not someone who's, you know, has hair down to, to his back and, and braids with a, a flowing purple robe or anything, you know. Um, and he's just a regular dude, you know. And it was such a fantastic thing that, that he he and and thousands of other people like that and so i think what you're saying is really key um uh bill that everyone needs to understand that they absolutely can do this can make contact and that if they just give themselves to it and say i can do it and learn the techniques it becomes something that just flows and it's really exciting when it starts happening and why not and why not it's fun (laughs) it's awesome (laughs) Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bill Gray, for being uh, with us today. We're about out of time, and I and, uh, appreciate you sharing all your accounts with us. Thank you. And uh, to the folks at the World Fusion Network, thank you for hosting us here every two weeks. And to all of you, uh, if you're interested in this next expedition to uh, Marco Island, Florida, it will be in February, and the information is at etcontactnow.com. And uh look forward to seeing all of you there. Okay. Keep looking up, and God bless. Bye-bye.